Today we're going to talk about mercantilism, slavery, and the economy in South Carolina. We are dealing with Social Studies Standard 8-1.5, and it says explain how South Carolinians use their natural human and political resources uniquely to gain economic prosperity, including settlement by and trade with the people of Barbados, rice, and indigo planting, and the practice of mercantilism. Again, we're talking about the natural human and political resources how they use those to gain economic prosperity, or in other words, how did they get rich off of mercantilism, okay? All right, so up front, up first, actually, we have this map of the triangular trade route, and we can see that from South Carolina, we grew rice, indigo, silk, and other things, and we exported that to England. England, in turn, traded with Africa and brought African slaves over through the Caribbean up into North America to help South Carolina grow those raw materials that they actually had. So we're going to look again at the mercantilistic policies and politics. So the mother country controlled trade in order to export more goods than it imported. So they wanted to export more goods than they imported. The mother country would get more gold and silver and become wealthy and powerful if they were able to export more than they imported. South Carolina had raw materials and they were a market for the British. So once South Carolina grew the raw materials and sent them to Great Britain, Great Britain again would turn it into something and sell it back to the South Carolinians. So they became a market, okay? Kind of think of it the way we go to Walmart. That's a market. Also, the mother country didn't depend on foreign trade, and it improved the balance of trade. So they had more exports than they had imports. Again, when you are dealing with mercantilism, you want to make sure that you're exporting out more than you're taking in. So the mother country didn't have to go to France to buy anything because everything they needed was produced in their colonies. Therefore, they didn't have to spend the money, but they would make the money when they actually exported goods to these other places. So mercantilism continues. The British government encouraged the development of indigo by offering subsidies to planters that grew it. A subsidy is when they give a little bit more money for growing it. So let's just say you're set up over in South Carolina and now you say, okay, I want to grow indigo. The government would give you money to actually grow it. So people that lived in South Carolina got rich off of subsidies. Rice and indigo could only be sold to England. Again, the rice and indigo that they grew could only be sold to England. But South Carolina got rich because they had a secure market to sell their products to. So because they knew that the English people were going to buy those products, they knew that they could keep growing them. Okay? From down below, drop it. All right. So the British didn't enforce the law when it came to rice. So South Carolina could sell to anybody when it came to their rice. So they didn't have to just sell it to England. They could sell to France, Portugal, Spain. They could sell that Carolina gold all over the place, okay? All right, so this started the policy of salutary neglect. So because England did not enforce the laws that they made saying you can only sell to the foreign country, you can only sell to the mother country, um, this is called salutary neglect where you don't enforce policies. So again, mercantilism says you only trade with your mother country. But South Carolina had an exception with rice, so they allowed South Carolinians to sell their rice to other countries. This started the policy of salutary neglect because Britain did not enforce the policy of only selling to the mother country. I hope you guys understood that. All right, so again, South, Carolina, South Carolinians were able to get rich off of that rice because they could sell to anyone. They didn't have to only sell to the mother country. When you're allowed to break policy, this is called salutary neglect, all right? You need to remember that. South Carolina's raw materials. So South Carolina had a lot of natural resources that it used to get rich as well. So there were deer for hunting. We know we still see deer all, the, all over the place now. Pine forests for timber and for wood. You also had those pine forests for those naval stores that they got subsidies for as well. So they were paid to harvest naval stores such as pitch, tar, and rosin, etc. 
All right, there was fertile land, a mild climate, and we had a long growing season. So the land was very fertile. The climate is not too hot, not too cold, so it's mild. And we had a long growing season as well. The low country was suitable for rice production because you had a lot of different rivers and swamp lands. When you go down to Buford and to uh, Charleston in those areas, you see those swamp lands and you can kind of, when you pass over those bridges, you're looking at places where they probably grew rice, okay? Right, water is important for rice. So Charleston was a port. So Charleston got a lot of trade going in and out, in and out. So you can export and import, and we're doing it right here in South Carolina so you don't have to worry about sending it somewhere else, right? The waterways were navigable so they could ship their products other places. So if we think about the Sakahatchee River, um, you think about the Congaree River, think about the Waccamaw River, um, these other rivers, the Ashley River and the Cooper River down in Charleston. These waterways were able to be navigated by ships so they you know, didn't, worry, have to, didn't have to worry about the ships crashing. So they were able to ship their products throughout the state and to ship the products from down up in the up country down to the low country to be traded with other countries as well. Okay, so South Carolina had a lot of raw materials. You need to know this information. South Carolina, South Carolina also dealt in Indian trade. So they used natural resources to make their trade profitable. So they would harvest things and sell it to the Native Americans. And as you see right here, you have traders in this picture that traded fur and deer skins from Native Americans for beads, trinkets, guns, and alcohol. So the Native Americans wanted those beads, those trinkets, like little mirrors and combs and etc., guns and alcohol. So they traded that those things with the Native Americans to actually get rich as well. All right. They did try to force the Native Americans into slavery, um, but that kind of put a halt on the relationship that they had with the Native Americans once you, they tried to enslave them. And the Native Americans were not trying to be enslaved because they knew the land, so they could escape a little bit more easily than an African slave could because they can kind of just sneak out. All right, so again, the, Na the Native American relationship kind of ended when they started forcing them into slavery. All right, so that's dealing with the Indian trade. All right, so trade, they also traded with Barbados. Barbados was a colony, a British colony down in the Caribbean, and a lot of Carolina settlers came from Barbados. You should have heard about this in that founding of South Carolina uh, video that I had before, but a lot of settlers from Barbados actually picked up from that small island and moved to South Carolina when South Carolina was first uh, founded, okay? So because they had those connections, there was still a thriving trade with Barbados, Barbados being a British colony and South Carolina being a British colony as well. Okay, so there was a thriving trade between South Carolina and Barbados. The things that they sold, they sold cattle and Native American slaves to Barbados. And I just mentioned about the Native American slaves. If they kept them in South Carolina, they could escape because they knew the land. But a lot of times they would put them on ships and trade them down in Barbados. Okay, so they sold cattle and Native American slaves to Barbados. So these are some of the ways that South Carolina got rich off of that mercantilistic policy. All right, up next we have naval stores, rice, and indigo. So this is another part of the colonial economy. So naval stores, we kind of should know what these are. So pine trees in South Carolina provided pitch and tar used for making, water, making the ships that the British Navy had waterproof. So, you know, tar is very sticky, so they would put that all over the ships and make sure that those ships were waterproof. And the pine trees provided that tar. So, again, what is a naval store? So you have tar, rosin pitch, and turpentine from pine trees, okay? Used, again, to make British ships waterproof. And these products were important because they helped to waterproof the ships, okay? So naval stores, you need to know that. Up next, you have African slaves that were brought in as well. So the African slave trade brought laborers to the land. So they were growing these cash crops like rice and indigo. These were very labor-intensive cash crops that needed to be farmed, and they wanted specialized labor. So they brought in slaves from West Africa that already knew how to grow rice or those ones that were used to working in a plantation system from Barbados to actually come to South Carolina and 
farm those cash crops. Again, a slave does not have to be paid. So they pay that one time price for that slave and work that slave their entire life. A bit different from that indentured servant because the indentured servant is let go after a certain number of years. All right, so African slaves also had knowledge of cattle herding. So believe it or not, they did know how to herd cattle from when they were in Africa. They also knew how to grow rice. So they, again, wanted the specialized slaves or these slaves or these Africans that had that special skill of growing rice from Africa. Okay. All right. So rice, Carolina gold, you see it in the corner. So the rice grown in South Carolina became Carolina, became known as Carolina gold. All right. Um, it made South Carolina prosperous. And one of the ways it did that was because again, the swamps and the tidal rivers in South Carolina made South Carolina perfect for growing rice. And these slaves that came from West Africa that already knew how to grow that rice made that a prime spot to actually do that. Okay, so the rice production, or the more they wanted to grow rice, that led to the growth of slavery. Okay, so in the early 1700s, South Carolinians really relied on African slavery. Rice was not part of the South Carolina cash crop after cotton came on the scene, though. Right, so it was rice and indigo. It wasn't cotton just yet. That wasn't until the 1800s, all right? So agriculture grew because of the plantation owners and the slaves. So the more the uh, plantations grew and the more rice they wanted to grow, the more slaves they needed and the more specialized slaves they needed to come over to actually grow that rice, all right? So that's Carolina gold. Again, that's rice in South Carolina. Up next, we have indigo. So indigo, what is Indigo. You should know this. It's a plant used to make a bluish purple dye, and it was sold for a high price in Europe. It's used to dye yarn and cloth into a, dip, a deep, rich shade of blue. So people love that color. It's the color of royalty, and they wanted that indigo. Okay, there was a young lady named Eliza Lucas Pinckney. Uh, she was an immigrant from Antigua who wanted to make her father's plantation successful. And this was a little different because she was a woman. So back in the day, the women didn't run the farms, but she broke gender barriers when she wanted. She decided she wanted to make her father's plantation um, successful. So she started experimenting with the blue dye in the 1740s with the seeds and processing methods there on her father's plantation. And she basically made a nice strain of indigo that came from South Carolina. So the British government offered a subsidy or more money to anybody who would be willing to grow indigo so you say you're going to set up a plantation and you want to grow indigo the british government is going to give you some money so you can grow indigo okay all right also they shared seeds with neighboring planters once she produced a high quality dye so she kind of experimented in botany i would say um and came up with a good seed that would actually work and have a high quality dye they shared it with the other planters and indigo became a new cash crop for South Carolina because of Eliza Lucas Pinckney. Some things about her, and you'll see these in some of the videos that you'll watch later. She had four children, two sons. One was named Charles Coatsworth Pinckney. We'll learn about him later, but he was also an aide to George Washington. He ran for president twice. So this lady fathered a lot of important people in South Carolina. Thomas Pinckney, who was another son, became the governor of South Carolina, and he was the ambassador to Great Britain during uh, during and after the American Revolution. All right, so that's Eliza Lucas Pinckney. All right, that's the end of mercantilism. If you need to hear it again, rewind this back, play it again, make sure you study your notes, and follow along.